Hey, what's up folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, we're looking at Midsommar, writer-director Ari Aster's follow-up to last year's hit Hereditary, where a young couple whose relationship is on the rocks travel to a fabled Swedish Midsummer festival where a seemingly pastoral paradise transforms into a sinister, dread-soaked nightmare as the locals reveal their terrifying agenda. You know, before we get started on this one, it just feels like something is missing. Hmm. Yes, flower crown, thank you. And of course, mushroom tea. Mm. Mm. Ooh, now we're talking. The psychedelics are quite appropriate for this one. Not just because pretty much everyone is on drugs the whole movie, but because the entire movie feels like undergoing a drug trip, which of course was Ari Aster's intent. This is a really interesting one for a number of reasons, especially being set almost entirely during the especially long Swedish days. Somehow the oppressive daytime becomes scarier than the darkness and shadows we usually associate with horror. Yet to call Midsommar just horror is an understatement because it tackles so many genres at once. It ended up being a heck of a lot more hilarious than I was anticipating. It was welcome levity to at times undercut the insanity of what was unfolding. And the movie does go to some extremely disturbing and violent places as well. Really runs the gamut there. When compared to his previous Hereditary, I would put Midsommar only slightly lower due to how shocking and surprising witnessing the events of Hereditary was to see unfold. On the other hand, Midsommar interestingly chooses to telegraph almost everything ahead of time of what is going to happen via rustic murals, which at times is also quite strange and hilarious. Yet in the end, things unfold just as we expect if we pay attention to these ever-present paintings. So it isn't quite as shocking shocking as a result, and feels a little less surprising and terrifying than the last 20 minutes of Hereditary. Also interesting is how similar in some capacities Midsommar is with his previous feature, a crazy killer cult enacting an elaborate ritual. Yet Midsommar manages to feel completely different than his predecessor in many ways despite these somewhat similar structures and stories. Similar to Hereditary, it requires a viewer to pay extra attention to catch every detail to understand the story, and I do want to undertake another viewing to I'm sure catch even more than I did the first time. And I do really appreciate the level of detail Aster puts into his movies so far. It's just impressive seeing his extremely distinct visions come to life. And Midsommar possibly takes the mantle away from The Wicker Man, obviously the original as the quintessential folk horror film. As I've already expressed, Aster makes very dense movies with stories full of so many details that are easy to miss. So I understand being completely confused by what transpires in the flick. But as you know, that's why I'm here, to put the pieces together Together and help everyone understand what the filmmaker was going for here. One of the biggest themes we'll be looking at is control, which is consistent throughout the film, first seen in Danny and Christian's broken relationship, but also in the copious amounts of psychedelics consumed, i.e. completely letting go of control. But it's our protagonist Danny who undergoes the biggest journey in this regard. In the final moments of the film, given the control and choice of taking someone else's life into her own hands, in the end, gaining total control Control. Yet as we also come to understand, even if it appears that we are making our own choices, there are grander forces at play in the universe and nature that enact their own predestined plans. So let's take a trip into drug-fueled ritualistic madness with Midsommar, breaking down the story, its bigger meanings and themes, as well as explaining the ending and Danny's final big decision. Our initial scenes show us the two very different perspectives that couple Danny and Christian have of their relationship. Danny clearly struggles with her emotions kind of a never-ending outpouring of emotions of which she has no control. While Christian is clearly 100% checked out of the relationship and is consistently emotionally unavailable to Danny, which she desperately needs. While she is afraid she is asking too much of Christian and taking her emotional burden, even on the phone worried that she's pushing him away. Her nameless friend on the other end assures her that being supportive is what a boyfriend is supposed to do. Christian's just a dick. Christian's friends, Pell, Josh, and especially Mark, have the polar opposite perspective annoyed having to hear about Danny's constant issues and are encouraging of him to end the relationship. And it does seem to be what he wants as well, considering how uninvolved emotionally he is, which is pretty ridiculous as they've been together for four years. If it's so bad, just end it already, dude. But his pals are even more adamant that he end it now, as they're on the verge of a big upcoming trip to Sweden where there is sure to be a bunch of hot Euro ladies for the taking. And it's all Pell's idea, bringing everyone along
along to visit his childhood home in an extremely tiny remote area of Sweden for their big midsummer festival. No one even seems to ask, hey, what are we going to be doing on this vacation anyway? Or even where exactly in the country we're going? Better not to ask questions in this case. I guess the prospect of learning about other cultures, at least for some of the students, is worth going in completely blind. Usually I'm like, okay, where are we going to go? Is there a theme park there where they got bars? I don't know what the hell we're going to do. Oh, we're going to the middle of a field in Sweden somewhere. We're going to take a lot of mushroom tea. I guess, I, okay, I guess I go along for that. I don't know. Though a major incident will throw a wrench in any potential breakup in the relationship, as Danny's bipolar sister has an episode that results in the death of both of her parents as well as her unwell sister, siphoning poisonous fuel emissions into their bedroom. Pretty disturbing stuff. Danny is heartbroken and an emotional wreck. She did just lose her entire family after all, and as she's uncontrollably wailing on her couch, Christian does his best at comforting her, yet ultimately seems more bothered that he couldn't possibly break up with her now after what happened. But things only get more awkward. When Danny learns about the Sweden trip, Christian had also been purposefully hiding the trip from her, assumedly hoping to have broken up with her by the time they went. But now the word's out, and he's obliged to invite her. He's confident that she won't go due to her massive recent tragedy, yet it appears that Pell is excited to have her tag along, informing her of one of their many traditions, crowning a May Queen at the end of the celebration, showing her his so-called sister that was crowned last year. He also tries to relate and comfort her about her situation, revealing that his parents both died in a fire many years ago. But even mentioning this triggers Danny into having another panic attack, showing us just how fresh that emotional wound still is, as well as her difficulties controlling said emotions in a meaningful way. The group traverse to the extremely remote Harga in the Swedish countryside, meeting Ingemar, a brother of Pell, who has brought a duo of outsiders himself, the English couple Connie and Simon. And to make sure we know exactly what kind of experience our group is in for right off the bat, they are offered a complex complimentary cup of mushroom tea, again letting go of control of oneself and letting the drugs take over. Danny is hesitant to dive in so quickly, but ultimately relents, having a pleasant trip initially, until Pell refers to the village group as his family, enough to get Danny upset again, excusing herself for a walk and her trip turns bad, getting paranoid that another group is laughing at her, rushing away to hide in a shed, but is terrified by a visage that appears in the mirror of her sister Terry. Back outside, the trees themselves appear to be kind of morphing or around her. Better get used to that, it happens a lot around these parts. And the intense experience causes her to promptly pass out, having fever dreams about her family. When she comes to six hours later, the sun's still up of course, they head to the Harga village proper, passing through a large sun-shaped symbol on the way in. Hmm, seems appropriate. And the village is about as rustic as you could possibly get. Just a bunch of people in white robes standing around and a couple of old buildings. One building in particular standing out to Josh. A mysterious large yellow triangle shaped one, yet he isn't given an answer answer as to what it is, beyond only to stay away. As the festivities begin, which appears to be alternating between dancing and meals composed of rotting, fly-covered strange meats, one of the villagers, Maja, has eyes for Christian, playfully kicking him as he sits in a circle, which is only the beginning of the group's love ritual, following the easy steps, and in the end, you get yourself a baby put inside you. Don't forget about the pube hair pie, what would romance be without it? Yes, that happens in the movie. The following day, it's time for a community-wide feast with two guests of honor, the eldest of the villagers, Yelva and the laborer, who lead the group in a breathing exercise before the gang rounds up to head to a rocky landscape. The elders cut their hands, wiping their blood on a symbol-covered stone before ascending to the top of a cliff, everyone watching in anticipation below, which turns to pure horror as Yelva walks off the edge and lands face first on a rock, tearing her face to shreds on the impact. Pretty dang gruesome, but her fate looks lighthearted compared to the laborer. He too leaps off, but only shatters his leg in the fall. Moaning in pain, the rest of the group mimics the sounds, all accepting his pain as their own. His agony will be short-lived at least, as a group of the villagers led by a dude with a wooden, I assume ritualistic hammer, smashes the laborer's face into a bloody pulp. Aster sure likes his head trauma, jeez. Only Simon and Connie express being absolutely mortified by what they witnessed. Siv, who seems to be the group's current leader, explains to the rest that the ritual is a natural part of the religion as the two elders had reached the age that is considered the end of their life cycle, and to prolong it any further would have negative ramifications on the community. It's laid out that in their religion, there are three stages to a human's life cycle, ending the third at 72 years old. And thusly, once reaching that somewhat ripe old age, the villagers choose to take their own lives, all part of the never-ending cycle of life. Her mentioning as the older generation dies out, the village is blessed with newly born children. It starts all over again. Simon and Connie are ready to get the heck out of here, 
Yet when Connie is all packed up, there's no sign of Simon around. She inquires about his whereabouts to a villager and is told that he already left. This is quite confusing to her. I mean, who would randomly decide to leave their fiance behind without a word? And she at least probes him with some reasonable questions. And the villager sticks with his flimsy story. That he's on his way to the train station and that she'll be taken there once a supposedly extremely tiny truck returns. She doesn't have much choice but to relent and walks off in anger. Clearly this story is straight baloney and Simon was taken to be killed and Connie will soon be joining him. I guess they weren't lying about the joining him part but in death. Now when I was reflecting back there is a major turn here in the villagers seemingly genial nature and it appears to be due to the couple's reaction to the elders death's last ritual. They are horrified by their practices and in this sense do not respect the village's long-held beliefs and as soon as they show this side to their behavior the villagers quickly kill them. Perhaps they were doomed either way but it is worth noting this consistent relationship between someone disrespecting the village's practices and then being killed. The boys on the other hand in particular Josh are interested in the village in a much more intricate way wanting to actually do his thesis paper on the Harga people and Christian ever the jerk ass thinks this is a brilliant idea and decides to copy Josh but at least offering to collaborate with him. Pell grants both of them access to learn more about their particular beliefs. Most importantly they are introduced to the group's religious text which unlike a typical bible is filled with many blank pages as their religion is constantly evolving and changing over time rather than being beholden into a finite set of words. The new pages are actually abstract drawings done by an inbred villager known as the seer. They are specifically inbred on purpose by the village, as they believe that only those like the deformed Reuben have a clear or open mind to truly see. Josh is hoping to snap some photos of the paintings, but the elder refuses. The freshly dead elder's bodies are buried in the village, and their ashes spread on a fallen tree, which they refer to as the ancestral tree, and has extreme reverence to the villagers. Assumedly, many, many many people's ashes have been spread there over the years. Of course, the fool Mark is unaware of its importance and literally takes a piss right on the side of the tree, overwatched by villager Ulf, who is so disturbed by the act that he literally breaks down into tears. And when he's informed of what he's done, Mark is confused and calloused, thinking he didn't do anything wrong, showing just how culturally lead-headed he is. And just as with Connie and Simon, he disrespects the village's practices. So it's not too surprising that at another feast that evening, a still pissed Ulf is angrily eyeballing Mark the entire time. And Mark is understandably afraid, worriedly asking the others if he's going to kill him. You betcha, as a female villager approaches, taking his hand and leading him away, never to be heard from again. Well, don't piss on the ancestral tree, bro. Pretty obvious there, come on. Even though Josh was denied permission, getting photos and thusly concrete evidence of the village's religion to validate his thesis is just too juicy of an opportunity to pass up. That night, he sneaks into where the book is held and begins to take pictures of the pages, interrupted by a figure at the front, which appears to be Mark. Woo, phew, guess he's okay after all. Until a surprise strike to the head stops him in his tracks for good. And it's revealed that it isn't Mark, but in fact, Ulf wearing Mark's face as a mask. Texas Chainsaw style. Well, yeah, he did. The next morning, the group is told that the book has gone missing. Not true. And thinking it must have been Josh that took it, Christian is quick to distance himself from his thesis buddy, saying they're not with him and do not collaborate with him, which is literally what he asked Josh to do earlier. A jerk through and through. Later that day, it's time for the big May Queen ceremony. And Danny is dragged away to join the other female villagers to dance around a maypole, a marathon of sorts. The winner is the last woman standing, who is then crowned the May Queen. But what fun is a dancing competition without some more hardcore psychedelics. Danny handed some more mushroom tea and the dance off begins. The drugs soon kick in and things start getting all weird and morphing trees and everything again. And strangely, Danny finds herself suddenly able to speak Swedish with the others. One by one, the girls fall and are eliminated. In the end, Danny being the last one standing, getting crowned the May Queen. Go Danny! Wait, is winning a good thing or a bad thing? I guess we'll see in a bit. Christian, who is kind of watching this happen, is given his own trip tea, watching blankly as Danny is whisked away saying nothing. And as she's watching, you can tell she's like, geez, you can't even support me when I become the May Queen. But it turns out he has another purpose to serve, ushered to the female elder's lodge, sitting in a room adorned with more significant paintings. The one that catches his attention of a bear on fire. Hmm. That's odd, but probably won't come back later. He is convinced by the elder to impregnate Magia, which he kind of agrees to, but just seems more of in a drugged out delirium and not exactly aware of what he's signing up for. There's no way he could have predicted how insane the mating ritual 
would be. First given some smelling salts for virility, before entering a room with Maja surrounded by 12 other naked women. He begins to make the sex with Maja, the other woman mimicking her moaning. Though things get supremely bizarre and awkward when one woman gets right up in Christian's face, and even lending a hand with his thrusting. Uh, thanks, thanks lady. It's really, really weird and kind of hysterical as well. Whether he's even cognizant of what he's doing or not, he still is making love with someone other than his girlfriend. And Danny unfortunately catches him in the act, watching everything go down through a keyhole in the door. This betrayal causes Danny to have a full-on breakdown, retreating to the living quarters to cry. Yet she learns that she doesn't have to face her emotions alone, as the other women come to join her. And as we've seen prior, they begin to sympathetically cry along with her. Finally, she has someone she can share her pain with completely in the group. Back at the hump barn, Christian finishes up and kind of comes to, suddenly mortified by his actions, and runs outside completely stark naked. And I'm only mentioning this one little detail because I've seen a lot of people asking, yes, he does have blood on his dong. Maja was a virgin, it turns out. As was said earlier, she was approved by the community for sexual relations the previous year, and it was Christians she set her sights on. As we know, they have their particular ritual, and that's what we've seen happen to him the whole movie. We know the villager also uses the outsiders that visit for procreation as well. Seeing some of his friend's body parts sticking out of the ground, along with discovering Simon's fate, strung up with his insides on the outside in what's called a blood eagle, generally associated with Vikings. The wonderful thing about it is that the victim is alive the entire time. Doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? And was generally considered as a form of punishment to honorless individuals, which does fit with the perspective the Hargo would have had about him. His naked escape attempt doesn't get too far, knocked out by a villager blowing a mysterious powder into his face. Wow, do they literally have like every drug on the planet in this village? It's like they have all these different drugs for different purposes. Pretty impressive stuff, guys. Now the time has come for the climax of our 90 year in the making ritual, which has one final decision that lies in Danny's hands. The elders bring in an especially drugged up Christian along with the villager Ingemar, asking her to choose someone for a sacrifice. Here we learn of the grand Midsommar ritual that the Harga people will undertake as they no doubt have for thousands of years. Their ritual requires nine total sacrifices, a number that was considered magical again to the Vikings. Kind of seems like that or pagan stuff is what they are inspired by. Requiring two of their own, the elders who cliff jumped to bashed heads earlier, four outsiders, as in our group brought in by Pell, Josh, and Mark, along with Simon and Connie, brought in by the jealous Ingemar, along with two living volunteers from the village and a final sacrifice decided upon by the May Queen, thusly putting this extremely important decision in Danny's hands. For once, she is the one in control. And after how shit he has been the entire movie and presumably the entirety of their four years together, she elects to, in the ultimate breakup move of all time, sacrifice her boyfriend as the final offering, getting by far the worst fate of all, the villagers disembowel a bear corpse and so Christian inside. And still drugged out of his mind, all he can do is sit there and let it happen in a stony haze. He's taken to the yellow building, now understanding that it is obviously an extremely important religious symbol for the group. The site of their grandest ritual, plopping Christian in his new bear suit, along with the bodies of the others inside. Some of the offerings have specific purposes we see. One body adorned with several branches and a kind of fan, another whose stomach was hollowed out and filled with fruits and vegetables, each an offering to ensure the prosperity of the land and their crops. And even Christian's bear suit is intended to keep the village safe from the predatory side of nature. They set the building ablaze. Christian can't do much beyond wheeze as the flames cover him, while Ingemar screams in utter anguish as the fire reaches his legs. This is funny to me because right before, another dude gives Ingemar some tree pollen or some shit, and is all like, this will make it so you won't feel any pain at all. But first thing, when the flames touch him, ah! <laughs> because yeah, that's that's gotta hurt. Sorry if I scared you there. The rest of the villagers echo their anguished screams as the fire spreads through the whole building. And Danny looks like she's starting to think she might have perhaps gone a bit too far and appears to break down yet again. Though we see her demeanor suddenly shift, listening to the unified screaming of the villagers. A demented smile begins to form on her face. There are many ways to interpret what happens in these final moments with that smile. It could be seen as Danny finally mentally snapping, basically losing her mind due to what she's witnessing. However, I think that smile is that after all of her hardships, including most importantly losing her own family in a grisly manner, she has now found, thanks to the Harga, a real family, somewhere she feels that she belongs and her emotions are appreciated and validated, something that was sorely lacking 
in a relationship with Christian. However, there are more questions. So this whole ritual thing was pretty big, and they stressed the importance of it having been 90 years since the last one. Yet we see an entire wall adorned with photos of previous May Queens before Danny, as though it happens each and every year. But as confirmed by Ari Aster, this particular final ritual is only performed every 90 years. While in the interim for Midsummer, they are still bringing outsiders for procreation and not sacrificial purposes. So I guess these people do get to have a ride back to town in the impossibly tiny truck rather than get killed. Because if they were also killing so many people every year, that would eventually draw attention to their tiny village. Oh, that's weird. All these people go on vacation in Sweden in this one particular spot and mysteriously disappear without a trace. Maybe the kind of thing worth investigating, you know? Every 90 years makes it a little easier to cover up a couple of deaths, even if that still is a little hard to swallow. Like, don't these people have families? Other than Danny, obviously. Someone's gonna be like, yeah, where'd Connie go? Oh, you didn't hear? She got sacrificed in Sweden. Ah, no big deal. Anyway, those details aren't really important when looking at the grander forces at play in the story, because it took a lot of major events to occur to get Danny in Sweden in the first place. And if we look at the overall story, it appears that there is a grand design at play with her journey, preordained in a way. It's mentioned that nature has a way of course correcting itself. This leads us to believe that every step was orchestrated by a higher power. Whether that's nature specifically, or the Harga's own ancient pagan deity, the point is the same. Every step of what happened was all part of a grander design, leading to Danny having to make her ultimate final choice, which finally frees her of her emotional burden as she becomes ordained the May Queen, as well as becoming part of the Harga. So as we understand, it's nature or the natural order or some predetermined fate thing that is the one really in control, which helps us understand the other question of the fates to each of the sacrifices. We see them each disrespect their religion and thusly are deemed worthy of being sacrificed, along with Pell having some hand in selecting the people he brings to the village. Like he knew Mark was just a fuck up and was like, yeah, this dude would totally piss on the ancestral tree. Yeah, that's a given. But it's his hand along with the grand design thing that gives him the perfect subjects, each respectively making errors that result in their death so the ritual can continue. Every piece of the puzzle coming together that even allows the ritual to occur in the first place. So in a way, none of us in that sense are truly in control. It's the universe, man. You can't control the flipping universe. It happened because it's supposed to happen. And that's the whole point I think he's going for. Overall, the story is full of terror and death. Yet for Danny, it was a positive and life-changing experience, akin to that of a fairy tale, which the movie evokes in many ways. Also, thanks to the power of fate, she has discovered her destiny and divine purpose amongst her newly discovered family. Which brings us to the conclusion of this ending explain on Midsommar. There is quite a lot to digest with this one, and to me it feels like it already warrants a second viewing. But we also have the home video release to look forward to, as Astor said he is working on a longer cut of the movie, adding 30 additional minutes of scenes. The movie is already almost two and a half hours long, this new stuff making it three hours long. Wow. Geez, sounds intense. Like I mentioned, the final moments with Danny could be seen as her losing her mind. While I believe it's actually positive in an albeit demented way, Florence Poe herself feels the mental break is the true ending, and mentions scenes that were cut that showed this trajectory more clearly. So maybe some of these scenes will make their way back in, and would provide a new perspective to the story and the ending overall. I was definitely a fan of this one, and after this in Hereditary, Ari Aster has emerged just like Jordan Peele to become a strong new voice in taking horror into interesting and unexpected directions. So I'm excited to see what he does next. Hopefully it doesn't have any weird religious cults in it though. He's definitely done that enough. But here he shows a much funnier side and amongst many next projects he mentions he's considering a full on comedy. It would be really exciting to see him stretch his distinct style into a whole new territory. Oof. Guys, sorry, I don't know. I'm not feeling so good. It's, it's, oh, what? Do you guys see that dancing thing over there? Ooh, I think it's the T's kicking in. Oh shit! Oh, I'm tripping balls! Oh. <laughs> Damn you, Aster! What did you guys think of Midsmar and its ending? What do you think of Danny's final moments and choice? Is Christian the biggest douche in the whole universe? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.